and what we can expect in the future, and what is inevitable, and what we don't know. And uh, I'm talking about this at the atheist group because I think it's very important for all of us to know this. I mean, where did we come from, or where did the universe come from, is a huge question that lots of atheists wrestle with. And I did for a very long time. Because as a kid, you're taught about the Big Bang Theory, but then out of the other side of their mouth, that same teacher will talk about how it's basically BS because they, they don't want to be teaching it. That's, that was my experience. Or I'd come home from science class, and my parents would tell me, uh, oh, you learned about the Big Bang, well, let's read the Bible, and I'll show you how it actually happened. And not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but I would, you know, I would like to see more people be able to decide for themselves based on the evidence that we have and the questions that we have about that evidence. So I'm going to go through the, um, the best answers to the questions that we have right now and what we've amassed over the centuries. And if anybody catches anything that I either said wrong or is confusing, please let me know. I don't pretend to be an expert about this, just an enthusiast. I'm very interested in it, but I'm not actually a, an astronomer, really, yet. So, <laughs> how did it happen? If I could get this thing to go here, sorry guys. And here we go. So, this is, um, th this is how it happened. Presentation's over. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. That's, that's almost how it happened. But there's a few um, noteworthy differences that we should go over. Mostly, Monty Python, God wasn't there, uh, as far as uh, the evidence that we have. So, the initial conditions are kind of, that's something you talked about in, in physics and math. It's like, what was there before everything happened, before some reaction? So, a lot of this is unknown, obviously, because it's only happened one time that we know of. We haven't been able to fully produce it in a lab. But if we kind of extrapolate backwards, if we kind of do some reverse math, we, we get a model where all the matter and energy in the universe that we know of was just in one point, and not like in a small area like a golf ball. We mean like one point, a point that has zero volume. It's like smaller than a, a dot on the board or a dot on a piece of paper. It, you, you can't measure it, but it's, it's all there. And the, what, that, what that leads to is infinite density. It, regardless of whatever amount of mass you have, if your volume is zero, you have infinite density. And the consequence of all that matter and energy being together was infinite temperature. So um, in, in this area where there is no space yet, there's also no time. And that means no physics. So it's kind of, you can see how this is very speculative, but this is really the only way it works so far. And we call this area the singularity. And, uh, and it's, there's a couple things that I want you to remember as I'm talking, and that is, first of all, that energy and matter Albert Einstein related these with E equals mc squared. Uh, that's important. You can convert from energy to matter and, and so on. And uh, the other important thing is that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And this might, um, this might kind of set off an alarm in your head because, wait a second, you know, if matter can't be created, then where did matter come from? And we're going to get to that, I promise. And uh, uh, kind of a corollary of this is that the sum of all energy in a closed system must remain constant. I think that's the second law of thermodynamics. That's something that a lot of creationists like to throw out and say uh, something can't come from nothing because of this law. And they're right, but they misuse it. So we're going to keep that law in mind. And then, of course, like I said, matter can uh, be converted to anything. So what, what did actually happen? What, what do we know happened? Well, at some point in our finite past, so not infinitely long ago, this singularity that I talked about started to expand. And there's a ton of speculation about why that happened. And personally, I think it makes sense if, um, if the temperature is that high, infinity, then uh, we know that things that are heated will expand. Kind of like, think about uh, hot air balloons or, or things like that. And uh, so this, if, at the moment that it starts to expand, we call that the beginning of time. That was zero seconds, zero minutes, zero hours, zero days. That's our, uh, our epic right there. And uh, the interesting thing is this expansion was happening at, at light speed because of the infinite temperature and the infinite density. So we have energy and matter going out at light speed from kind of a central area. And uh, a really, really strange thing that we've actually observed in labs, and the only thing that really explains the origin of matter is that at very high temperatures, matter and antimatter 
which is the opposite of matter. Think about like a positive and negative charge. If you could have positive and negative actual mass, you could have a Steven and an anti-Steven. And when these two meet, they completely annihilate and cease to exist, much in the same way that if you have a, uh, a positive magnet and a negative one and you put them together, kind of the sum of the magnetism in that single point is zero. So um, all, all this matter just is springing into and out of existence. Because when the two types meet, matter and antimatter, they almost immediately disappear. But then more will come into existence. It's a very strange thing. I don't know a ton about it, but we have observed this. And so at this point, when we say matter, we're talking about the smallest types of matter that we've seen so far. Uh, for example, quarks and their inverse, the anti-quark. And for some reason that we haven't yet figured out, this is something that's very difficult to study because it's difficult to reproduce on the same scale as the universe. But for some reason, a lot of the antimatter was annihilated and matter prevailed to the tune of 30 million particles of matter for every one antimatter. So there's way more of it. And uh, so, and as the, um, as the matter's going out, it's <coughs> starting to cool down because this kind of is coupled with the fact that it's no longer traveling quite as fast. And we, the reason we see that is that um, gravity is starting to take effect, one of our fundamental laws of physics. And I'm sorry if this is kind of like, I'm trying to make it abstract and not super scientific, but we can only go so low with that. So questions as they come, please don't be a stranger. So after, after 10 microseconds, 10 to the negative sixth, point zero 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 one seconds into the universe, we see uh, these quarks start to combine with other really, really, really small particles that we know of to make protons, neutrons, and electrons, which if you've ever had, um, if you had high school chemistry or physics, you know that these are the building blocks of atoms. And, uh, and then after a few, a few minutes after our Big Bang, the protons and neutrons come together to form the nuclei of atoms. At this point, they're not combining with the electrons yet but there's a force that holds protons and neutrons together. The name of it escapes me, but it's one of the like four fundamental forces in the universe. And do you know it? Uh, strong force. What's up? Strong force. Strong force. <laughs> so this process is called nucleosynthesis, nucleo, nucleosynthesis, you know, combination, I guess. And not a whole lot interesting happens for 379,000 years by our models. And, but at this point, the electrons come into, uh, not quite contact, but they come into the vicinity of these, of these nuclei, and we have hydrogen and helium atoms. Our first atoms, 379,000 years after the Big Bang. It's amazing stuff. And uh, the interesting thing is the, the radiation, so the energy that, was, that took place in the nucleosynthesis and these other reactions, it wasn't um, bound by the same forces, the gravity and the attractive force of the atoms, so it actually continued out, unbounded, unslowed down in any way. And this is what we measure today when we look into space with good enough radio telescopes and things like that. Or even on Earth, you can measure some of this. It's called cosmic uh, background radiation. And uh, so more and more gravity is starting. Yes? Is that how they figured out um, the 3,000, I mean, 379,000 years? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. It's, um, I'm not going too far into the like experiments and calculations because I think a lot of that is really dry. But I have uh, I'll post some links on the group if anybody's interested in reading about this stuff. But I'm kind of going through like the I'll say like bare minimum of it with a little bit embellished the stuff that I found particularly interesting. But so as our matter is clumping together into atoms, and the atoms are coming together in groups, uh, gravity becomes more and more powerful because gravity depends on how how big or how massive something is. And we're getting larger and larger bodies. And as these become further apart, they, for some reason, we, we notice that uh, they're still expanding. So the distance between them is expanding, right? Not the atoms are getting bigger, or the space between the protons and neutrons is getting bigger, but the space between bodies that are bound by gravity is getting bigger. So think of like in our solar system, if all the planets started getting really far apart, the things that aren't bound together. But, uh, so it turns out what caused this is something called dark matter, which isn't antimatter. It's just matter that has some very strange properties, <coughs> like 
darkness. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't emit any kind of light. It doesn't reflect light. It's kind of strange. And as far as I know, it doesn't emit heat, but don't, don't quote me on that. And so this, it turns out, is a pretty, um, it's a weak force compared to gravity. But as the bodies uh, become further apart, dark matter can kind of insert itself into the gap and, and push them apart. And this actually accelerated the expansion. We kind of have our foot back on the gas pedal of the expansion of the universe. And uh, as, as time goes on, we get more and more matter clumping together to form some more familiar things that we know about. Stars, galaxies, black holes, quasars, and eventually planets. And the, we, at this point, we still have hydrogen and helium. And it's interesting, we've, we've figured out where we get the rest of the elements from, because we have over 100 elements in our periodic table. And the difference between each one is just how many neutrons and proton, protons and electrons are in there. And it turns out that these get formed when the stars collapse, when the star undergoes a supernova, it will collapse all of its matter into a, a smaller point and then explode. And when it does that, the atoms get combined into heavier elements. So for example, we can get helium uh, to turn into carbon if three heliums get smushed into, into one carbon because uh, helium has the two protons and two neutrons in the center usually, and carbon has six. So three times two gives us six. And we can see where oxygen comes from and every other element that you can think of that hasn't just been synthesized in the lab. And so these get expelled out into space during these massive explosions, and they kind of traverse the galaxy. They, they are moving very quickly, and eventually they'll come together. And eventually, this is what led to life here, specifically when carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, um, phosphorus, and sulfur all combined in various ways. I'm not going to get into biology in this, but this is where those particles came from. People say, oh, well, where did we get the organic, or the, the particles necessary for organic molecules? It's from supernova, okay? And a really interesting thing to think about is that all the molecules in your bodies or everyone else, any living thing on Earth, can be traced back to like particular stars. Now, we don't have the ability to look and say, yes, my finger here came from Alpha Centauri, and this thumb came from Virgo, but it's it all was produced in stars. And this is where uh, this Carl Sagan quote comes from. We've begun at last to wonder about our origins, star stuff contemplating the stars. He says that we are all star stuff, meaning we're made of stars, and that's pretty accurate. So how does the universe look today? We know where it came from and how it happened. Right now, we've, we've measured it to ba with basically zero, close to zero error, at 13.75 billion years old. Um, and this is, there's so much evidence for this that I couldn't possibly get into it here, but I encourage you to read about it if you have any doubt or if you have any questions about it. And again, this was extrapolating backwards. We look at the way things are moving and then we just kind of play the tape in reverse with math and see that it all was in one area. And a guy named Edwin Hubble, whose telescope you may be familiar with, uh, conducted experiments to figure out that the universe is actually expanding in all directions uniformly, which is great evidence for something like a Big Bang, if it's all kind of coming out from a central area. And the question is, how, how did he do that? How do we know that? This is an important thing to consider. And uh, the way this was done was by observing distant galaxies moving away from us and assuming they must have been closer together in the past. And how do we measure that, though? We obviously can't take a ruler to a galaxy and then measure it next year and see how far away it is. And the way we do that is uh, kind of a phenomenon called the Doppler effect, which you may be familiar with this. If a fire truck is coming at you, the siren sounds one way, and when it passes you, it sounds another way. It's kind of like the wee <laughs> Anybody heard that? You know what I'm talking about? So it turns out that light does the same thing. But with light, you don't hear it, you see the difference. And what happens is, if you look at this graphic, the top picture shows a sun or a galaxy moving away from someone. The bottom picture shows it coming towards them. When it's moving away from you, it seems to be more red than it normally would be, depending on what it's made of. And when it's coming towards you, it looks more blue. Now, it's not that necessarily the galaxy will be bright blue in the sky. You can say, oh, it's coming right towards me. It's that these things emit certain wavelengths of light. And on the scale, you have a red end and a blue end. And it'll be more towards the red end if it's going away, more towards the blue end if it's getting closer. And it turns out that Every galaxy that we measure around us is, is reddish. It's, it's redder than it should be. And I'm going to kind of show you why that is. 
So look at, these are the, the, all the galaxies around us, and assuming that they're uniformly distributed at some random time, they call it T1 and oops, sorry about that, uh, T1 and T2. So you can see they're closer together in the white picture and further apart in the orange uh, picture. And if you, um, if you put them, superimpose them, we're gonna pick um, this guy, oops, okay. <laughs> so the laser pointer turns off the PowerPoint. So, okay, so this guy is gonna be Earth, or the Milky Way galaxy here. And it looks like everything's moving away from us. Do you see that? It looks like we're the center of the universe. But we saw before, that everything is expanding uniformly. This is just a perspective phenomenon. It looks like we're the center, but we know that there really isn't a center of, uh, of the universe so much as everything is moving away from each other. And that's really important to, uh, to consider when you think about claims like the Catholic Church when they arrested Galileo for his model of the solar system, right? Or when you had guys who were trying to proved that the Earth was the center to back up some kind of biblical claim. This kind of um, rains on their parade, and I don't like that. So I'm going to talk about now the last thing, the future of the universe. And the future of the universe is really determined by the shape of it. And we kind of have three main categories that the current shape falls into, or could fall into. And we have to figure out which one it is, and each one of those has consequences associated with it. So the first type is this sphere here. This is called a closed universe. It has fixed borders that it can't go outside of, so to speak. And it actually is curved in the fourth dimension. And I'm not going to get into how, uh, how that really works. These pictures are 3D representations of four-dimensional things. So this is basically just saying, like, if we're in a closed universe and you look far enough in one direction, you can see the back of your head because space curves are all the way around. Now. That has a very interesting complication, wherein at a certain point the universe gets so big that it'll uh, it'll stop accelerating, slow down accelerating, and then collapse in itself. And people call this the big crunch, the opposite of the big bang. All matter in the universe comes down to a singularity. That would be problematic because the universe would end and then potentially restart. So it's something that's fascinated people because they wonder how how many iterations of the matrix have we been through at this point, <laughs> and. Uh, so the second type is this open universe. It's curved, but it's unbounded. It can expand forever, but space, the, the space that we live in is completely curved. Not just because, for example, you know, we discovered recently that the space around the Earth is curved because of its mass, but they're saying the whole universe is curved regardless of what mass is in there. And um, this would not have a big crunch, and I'm not exactly sure what would happen <coughs> eventually. You know, who knows what could happen as this curves around. But the last one is the, the flat universe here. Not curved in the fourth dimension inherently, can expand forever, and there's no border to it. So Lawrence Krauss, very famous physicist, I'm a huge fan of his, he gave a lecture called A Universe from Nothing. Lots of the material from this actually comes from there, but he is a, uh, I think he's a Nobel laureate physicist, so I think he speaks in a little more complicated terms than some of us would like. And he actually was on a team who measured and calculated the definite shape of the universe, and now we know. And it turns out that we have the flat universe. So what does that mean? Well, we're not gonna have the big crunch problem. The universe is going to expand forever unbounded. And this is actually really, really great for us atheists. Why? Because in a flat universe, we know the total energy of the universe has to add up to zero, okay? which is kind of problematic, except when you consider we can have things that have negative energy. Like we have our matter and antimatter, we also have energy and what you can call an anti-energy. So the whole something from nothing thing doesn't really matter as long as your energy adds up to zero. You can balance your equations if for every five protons that are created, five antiprotons are also created. Now remember, we observe in labs that matter and antimatter come into existence in pairs of the same amount. The net energy of that is zero. We have seen something come from nothing, and we live in a universe that permits that. So the universe cheats all the time <laughs> in the something from nothing rule. Our, our universe is going against what apologists would tell us, that you can't have something from nothing. As a matter of fact, we can, and we do, and we did. So no need to sweat. 
we have we have our answer. How where did it come from? We know. It's it's phenomenal information. And of course, the universe will never stop expanding, like I said, which is great news. And because we won't be here for this, but eventually things are gonna look troublesome. The it turns out the expansion isn't isn't slowing down, it's speeding up. We have like a car that could be going really fast, it could go faster, that's acceleration, faster every second by pushing on the gas pedal. Dark matter is our gas pedal. Dark matter goes, uh, it penetrates, I guess, every empty space that, that is uh, in the universe and it pushes bodies further and further apart. And as the gravity weakens, it's able to push harder because the gravity isn't kind of, the planets aren't pulling on each other anymore, not the planets, the bodies aren't pulling on each other, and dark matter can just push them at accelerated rates. So eventually, the expansion of the universe will approach light speed again, like it did early on. But now, as things get so far apart, gravity essentially will be meaningless between galaxies. This is happening at the, at the galactic level. So every galaxy eventually will be infinitely far apart from every other one. So what does that mean? All evidence of the Big Bang will be gone. If we have scientists, this is supposed to happen like um, 500 billion years from now, I think it was. So if there are scientists who are around to, to contemplate the cosmos, they could use real, accurate science, measure all the same things that, in the same way that we did, but they'll get completely different answers. Because they can't measure the red shift, blue shift stuff. They, they can look out and you know look out into space, and they won't see anything, because at this point, even the background radiation will permeate it so far that essentially, if you look you know, far enough in the future, there, there won't be any way for them to tell that they're not the center of the universe. And that is going to spawn, I think, some very interesting religions. <laughs> <laughs> their model will be completely accurate by, by their own science, but completely wrong by the way we know it today. So what, what does that mean for us? Lawrence Krauss, the physicist I mentioned, says, we live in a very special time. It's the only time when we can observationally verify that we live in a special time. So instead of these scientists of the future who are completely isolated from everything, the whole rest of the universe that at this point is infinitely big, it's difficult to think about, but if you have infinite acceleration, that's kind of the way it works. So we can look at the past, the present, and the future of the universe simultaneously. We know where we came from, we know where we are, and we know where we're going. And I think that is an excellent gift that, uh, that we're, you know, I won't say blessed to have, but it's something, something to think about. If, if we had been too far in the past, we didn't have the technology to measure this. Or if we had been a few minutes into the universe, we would think that things are going to go a certain way, and then all of a sudden, that doesn't work. And if we're in the future, you know, we, uh, we would have a very different idea than, than what we have here. So Christopher Hitchens is fond of saying that if there's an intelligent designer, then this is some design. We're, we're seeing not only can something come from nothing, we demonstrated this, but eventually the inevitable is that nothing is going to come from the something that we have now. So we're, I think we're all very, very lucky to be alive during this time where we can uh, get that knowledge. So that's what I have. If anybody has any questions, I encourage you to um, Pose them. Yes. I wasn't actually here for the whole presentation. That's a shame. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy it, but I had a friend of mine added a whole other layer onto what you just explained. It, if you don't mind me explaining it. Um, so we talk about the three dimensions. Um, well, the first first of all thing I'm getting at is like did you you didn't talk about the fourth dimension? I mentioned it, but it's you mentioned it. Okay. I did this, this was so totally cool to me. Like, it just still blows my mind. But, um, so we have length, width, height. We've got three dimensions. Everyone here is seeing three dimensions. Um, but, like, what is the fourth dimension? Um, to really imagine the fourth dimension, we have to imagine, like, a loaf of bread. And we have to imagine our universe as one of the slices in that loaf of bread. Um, and that whole loaf is the fourth dimension. Um, the slices of bread in that loaf actually vibrate and move around a little bit. And this is all like theory. We can't verify any of this, but the 
theory is that when those slices of bread bump against each other, that's your e, e equals mc squared, energy equals matter. That's your big bang when those slices of bread bump against each other. And that's where your universe comes from. You have another slice in the loaf of bread. Yeah, people have compared that to, uh, or I forget who it was to mention this, but like if you had a whole bunch of soap bubbles, you know, just in a, in a ball in your hand, and all the time they might be, you know, going away, collapsing and going away, or new ones are popping up. And each one kind of borders on the other, and you can't get from one to the other. It's, it, you're talking about a multiverse, yeah. where there's an infinite number of possible universes. So this one that we live in exists an infinite number of times. It's great to speculate on, but so far, no proof. So Yeah, but it helps answer the question of, well, like, where did the Big Bang come from? Why did the Big Bang happen? Oh, you missed that part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, um, one thing I would like to add, that all of this information, even though it is evidence, like even when arguing with um, uh, religious people, it really doesn't disprove the existence of God. It's of course like, not. Yeah, of course it's just not. background knowledge. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to say that it does. I'm just saying yeah. that the claim that yeah. a God is necessary, absolutely necessary for these yeah. things to happen, is not true. It could have been caused by all that, but we have a natural explanation. And I think a natural explanation is always preferable to a supernatural explanation, yeah. if one exists. What's up? Alright, um, I, I apologize for my weak understanding of physics. I'm clearly a philosopher. <laughs> um, but uh, the one thing I didn't get in the presentation was the Big Bang, um, the cause of it. I, I know it was the um, temperature. But well, uh, speculatively, I mean, yeah. we can't say for certain. Right, speculatively, part, the temperature. But. I'm just wondering what was the change that caused it to start expanding if the temperature was already at infinite? Yeah. That that was the, like, I'm wondering if there's any literature on that. Or. Um, there are ideas, and that's why, that's part of the reason I say that we don't know that part for certain. But we know that at some point, we can measure that it happened, right? And uh, that's, you know, the further back you go, the less we know about it. So I, I can't tell you absolutely for certain, but we you know we know the way that matter and temperature kind of interact, and so it's it's logical that at a certain point maybe it's you know remember it's it's pointless to talk about time at this point right we don't have how long was the singularity there it it wasn't right it you know it, time existed when it expanded so um, it could be that. Uh, that there was one matter antimatter pair that came into existence and then expanded or or not it's it's something we, we just don't know but we know how it uh, how it could have happened so when talking to theists or philosophers um, <clears throat> or anybody who's scientifically illiterate and you're trying to sort of explain um, quantum physics <laughs> and, and um, you know uh, cosmology Something that I like to emphasize is, you know, some, every scientific theory has limits, right? We have, there are limits to human knowledge. There are, you know, limits where the current working model peters out. So, for example, the instant of the singularity is where our current models peter out. And we have various theories to account for it, but, you know, contemporary physics cannot account for t equals zero at the moment. Maybe it will when they finish building the CERN particle accelerator, but at the moment it's simply not something which current physical theory accounts for. What I like to emphasize, the, the actual moment of the singularity as opposed to, and this is what I like to emphasize is, well how far back our model does work is 13.5, 13.75 billion years ago minus 10 milliseconds. So you're right. No, no, there less, is, less, this is the important point. It's minus we, 10 to the negative 32 seconds, right. which is I mean, like... So the very beginning, time equals zero, this is the part where the model doesn't work. But it does cover, you know, 10 milliseconds or picoseconds or, you know, a minute amount of time after this sort of initial point. Our model works, current models of, current models of physics work, apply back, you know, 13.75 billion yeah. years into the distant past. And this, this is really That's a pretty decent working model yeah. for now. Oh, yeah. And it, it gives... The model, according to the literature, to... Yeah, there's... Dad it's, it. It's, it, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's... Not a lot of it's really experimental, because we can't... Physics. Yeah, it's hard to replicate those conditions, except mm -hmm. in hypothetical models. <coughs> but it does kind of indirectly give this multiverse hypothesis a little more credence. 
because the question of where did you know our our lump of energy come from, if it was one of these other soap bubbles kind of pushing it into existence, then we have our answer. Or if it, you know, some people are, uh, the deists in particular are fond of saying that this was instigated by a deity who then stepped away. And personally, if somebody wants to believe that, I'm okay with that, as long as they don't say he did anything after that. But <laughs> it's, not, it's not necessary to assume that that's what happened. It's okay to say, I don't know for certain. That's, and that's something that a lot of us have to struggle with, and that some people absolutely refuse to do which is why um, intelligent design and things like that end up so permeated in our societies because people are uncomfortable with, I don't know. But uh, any other questions, or is everybody just hungry? And if anyone else would like to do a presentation like this on any topic that would be um, interesting to atheists, feel free to let me know. Um, I think November, we don't have anyone scheduled to do anything. So just let me know. Yes, so. Okay.